Welcome. Happy Saturday. Look at all these jammers. Good Lord. What a crew. Oh my gosh. This is great. Hopefully we'll have um, good internet. So far, everyone looks better than they probably do in real life. That's the beauty of Zoom. And I'm sure you all smell better than you do in real life. That's the other beauty of Zoom. And as long as the internet does it. That's my favorite Zoom joke. You ever notice how you never freeze up on a good face? <laughs> it's always an awful face. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know I could do that with my eyes. Wow. Everybody having a good time? Yes, how about nice. you? It's a wonderful weekend so far. Um, it's 10 in the morning for me. Uh, musicians crack of dawn. But uh, luckily in my old age, I've been... Um, it used to be that I went to bed at 4 a.m. Now I get up to stumble around to the bathroom at 4 a.m. So it's a little different. Not quite as glamorous. But nonetheless, I guess times are changing. Cheers to uh, aging gracefully for all of us. And um, banjo and bluegrass as a device to keep us all happy. And I would like to open by saying I'm really glad to be surrounded by people who do music for fun. I'm not sure if you know, but statistically, 75% of the people who play music, out of that, three quarters of them are musicians. So it, it does add up when you think about it. <laughs> Although, you know, I'm not the best mathematician being a banjo player. Five strings, three fingers, four tuning pegs, something sticking out of the neck. It's it's a mess to say the least. I'm I'm kind of bantering here as I wait for our last couple people to log in. So uh, get your coffee in you. I see some of you. Uh, hey Jeremy, nice animal there by the way. I assume that's yours. Yeah, yeah they uh, they, they wanted to be outside, so we came outside. The local, the local wildlife is involved. I love it. It's great. Right, yeah, yeah, they love it. <laughs> you start playing banjo, they'll run, though. They hate my playing. I think if you play behind the bridge, they like that. All right. <laughs> the notes that dogs like. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad you all made it. I'm going to have a fun time with this group today because it's something that you... Uh, it's really ironic. I'm trying to teach you how to be off paper, and yet <laughs> I'm, I'm using paper. So it is a little contradictory. Please bear with me. Those of you who did print out your outline, have it to take notes on, just in case, you know, I say something profound. Um, and then we we're going to step into this by saying the benefits of this is not counting the outline. Um, basically, you're going to be able to be off paper when you learn songs. So I'm going to go ahead and, and summarize today's class by saying we're going to basically give you superpowers. Like a, like a musical superhero. If you can hear a song on YouTube or from another person and your eyes turn into little spirals and you do all the tricks that you learned today, you'll literally be able to play songs and sound like you already knew songs you didn't know. Okay? Story of my career. So uh, all it takes is a pair of ears. That's the thing. You're, you have a musical ear if you aren't deaf. Everyone told Beethoven he couldn't be a composer because he was deaf, but he didn't listen to them. <laughs> People have been saying, I'm going deaf for years, but I'm not hearing much anymore about that. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs> I have a guy that shows up on Zoom for his lessons. And it's all dark. I can hardly see him. I can tell he's wearing nothing from nothing but overalls. He's in Arkansas, but I can see chickens running around behind. And they're awfully noisy. <laughs> and uh, I learned eventually that these are emotional support chickens. I didn't know they had those, but they're still really noisy. So we're always jumping off and on the, the mute button. That's a very handy button. I will leave that subject by saying, I'm sure you all know people that you wish you could mute in real life, especially tambourine players. So let's start with item two, the misconceptions about this. There's always myths and misconceptions. And I have a particular issue with the idea that you have to be naturally talented to learn music by ear. You have to have been graced with this gift from the divine, and you it's not something you can learn. I started with zero talent. Some would say I still am there. I never learned how to read music until my mid-20s. Um, and by the way, it's all 
documented in my book, Banjos and Babylon. Shameless plug here if you haven't got it. It's a great read. I've got four signed copies left. You can find it on the website. But I literally was a kid learning just by scratch by ear. So a lot of the things that came back to me as I thought about this today, I think you'll find you might already be doing. So the myth of natural talent is not something you want to subscribe to. I think it's, it's circumstance, desire, and discipline, and or someone's forcing you to do it like your mother and you were taking piano lessons. And I still got a lot of people coming to me that used to take piano lessons and they're going through some PTSD about that. We know why the piano was invented. So banjo players have a place to put their drink, historically. Now let's look at item three now, ears. The fundamentals of learning. And in fact, this class inspired me to think about writing a book and I'm thinking of calling it Ears How. Or maybe uh, Ears What You Need. <laughs> ears What You Need to Know. But if you've got two ears, and I know most of you do, um, in fact, you could do it with one ear. Hopefully you don't have to. We're going to talk about the foundations under 3A. And what this means is there's two things that sort of prove that you have a musical ear. If, if I hum a note, la, and you're able to hum or sing that same note with me, la, then you have a musical ear. Now, I have encountered one or two people in the past that weren't able to do that. Um, they were usually producers. But... Most of us are able to match a note when you hear it. So there's really only unison, which is the same note, and then there's higher and lower pitches. Everything we talk about today is based on the idea that there's only notes that are the same and notes that are higher and lower. We're going to keep reducing it to that when it starts to get complicated or sound scary, okay? So now moving on to uh, item B under three, this is an exercise. And by the way, those of you who are ready to take notes, I'm going to be mentioning certain exercises I want you to be doing. And one thing I call hear and hum. And this is something that even if you've never sang a lick in your life, you want to be able to hear a note and then do your best to hum along with it. It could be a car horn. It could be an alarm. Um, when I drive to the store without my seatbelt on just to feel like a, you know, a <laughs> a daring individual. Uh, it goes ding, ding, ding. I will hum along with that. It's A, actually. Um, so we're going to do circle back to some more humming and hearing exercises, but maybe take a note that hear and hum is a thing you could do in the shower. Most of us probably sing in the shower. The only problem there is you get soap in your mouth and then it's a soap opera. So uh, moving on past that, we're going to talk about item C under three. And I call this perfect pitches is for horses. Perfect pitch is if you hear a note and you can say what letter name it is. That's all that is. I have found that that's kind of not that useful in jamming or playing with other musicians or learning a song by ear because we have all these tools to learn the letter name of the note. We're not concerned with A or C or E. We just want to know how to find it on our instrument or with our voice. It doesn't really matter what the letter is. So perfect pitch, we're going to throw it out of that window, and I'm going to describe for you what I call a relative pitch. This is something that's a great skill to develop, and all of you are using relative pitch already in one way or another. All that means is if you hear a note, and then you hear another note after it, you know if that next note is higher or lower than the first note. That's number one. I know you can all do that. The next exercise we're going to start doing with relative pitch is learning how to identify a note after hearing the song play a key. So if you hear a song that's in G, and you've been humming and hearing, and hearing and humming long enough to go, mm, la 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 la, that's my main note, That's the, that sounds like I'm home, then you're gonna ask yourself, what's the note lower than that? And what's the note higher than that? By the way, when you practice the things I'm going to give you in this class, it's going to sound really weird to your friends and loved ones. So that's why I often suggest doing these exercises in the car or once again in the shower. Most of the banjo players in my groups know what a banjo player with perfect pitch is. Someone who can throw his banjo into a dumpster from 30 feet. That's the closest we're going to get to perfect pitch with this instrument. Let's look at relative pitch um, in the sense of an exercise I want to give you. This is something I want you to play with your fellow musicians and jammers. And I'm going to pick a volunteer 
Uh, Kimberly, could you unmute yourself, please? We're going to do a very quick demonstration of relative pitch. Kimberly, can you pick your third string G? I'm going to have you pick that same string, Kimberly, and press it at any fret you want on the neck. And I'm going to turn away, and I'm going to tell you what fret you're at. Is that 10? Yep. Do a harder one. That was easy. I tried to give you sort of hard. Is that 16? Yes. Okay. How can I do that? <laughs> Kimberly me didn't work this out ahead of time, I promise. <laughs> That's doing relative pitch exercises because having heard that G note, when she played the other notes after it, I'm seeing the fingerboard in my mind. And when she did the seven and I'm hearing G, I just in my mind went, B, A, B, C, D, or zero, two, four, five, seven. So you can develop the so-called amazing skill where you can hear any song and be able to identify the notes in that song through relative pitch. So forget perfect pitch, let the horses do that. Relative pitch is what we want to develop in today's class. And most of this is gonna be about developing that skill. Now, moving on to item D. This is something that those of you who do lessons with me, we talk about a lot, and I call it hearing the flavors. Once you are able to determine the highness or lowness of a note when you're learning by ear, which you're gonna do through relative pitch, knowing the key, then all you need to do is figure out what flavor that note or chord is, or that scale. And basically the way I think about it, there's major and minor and seventh and I'm going to discuss this more in item six, but let's discuss the three flavors in music. Most of you know that if you hear a chord that sounds like a C chord, most of us would consider that a fairly bright sound. Happy, upbeat. If you hear a C minor, the mood is definitely different, boys and girls. Now, whether we use subjective terms like sad or happy or dark or light, we have to all agree upon the fact that this C major and C minor are two very different flavors of the same dish. So one of the exercises you're going to do, and take a note of this, is have a friend play any chord as a major or minor or seventh, and you're going to not look, and you're going to guess not what key it is, but if it's major, minor, or seventh. This is how you develop your ear ability to guess the flavors of a chord. Because think about this, friends. If you can go to YouTube, you can figure out what key it is. Using the chord families, which we're about to discuss, you can figure out what chords are being used. And there's no paper used at all so far. And then you're gonna be able to hear whether those chords are major, minor, or seventh. There's nothing stopping you from ear learning any song. And we're only 15 minutes into the class. If that's all you took away today, that's huge. Knowing that you can distinguish by your ear what note or chords being played relative to the key, relative pitch, and then if it's major or minor or seventh, by hearing the flavor of the chord. That's the core of the group today. So now moving on from that very heavy duty concept, we're gonna go to um, understanding songs by ear in item four. There's five ways I've noticed in 40 years of teaching students learn a song when they're learning a song. Number one, they learn just the vocals. That's often singers do that. and They don't play an instrument necessarily, okay? Number two, we learn just the chords. And I recommend this actually, boom chucking or rolling or strumming through the chords because that allows you to play a song with other people or jab along with YouTube. So the I, I say chords are king, but that's as a jamming individual, that's my philosophy. Number three under four is chords and vocals. Those of you who sing, then you'll want to go like, let's say that song is Tom Dooley. You just learned, hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Hang down your head and cry. But then you want to play it for some friends. You're going to want to know that the chords are G, 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 here's the D. And you put them together and you're now you're more like someone leading a song at a jam. Uh, then number four is instrumental melody. That's learning how to pick out... Just the pure melodic form of the song, okay? And then finally, there's an instrumental arrangement. That's where we take that pure melody 
and we spice it up a bit. Banjo people will add rolls and slides and hammers. Mandolin people will add tremolo and double stops. Every instrument has its way to spice up the melody, and that's called arranging. We'll circle back to that on page two. Let's talk about basic structures, and this is the first time we're gonna use a chart. So talking about the, my song anatomy chart, can I you ask can, you a question at this point? Yes, uh, please. I love so these sort of questions. So uh, what's surprising to me is you don't have chords and melody at the same t at the same because that's what we've been working on is throwing in chords and melody, and I didn't I didn't hear that combo. That is under the category of instrumental arrangement. So but basically, you, about, you have spicing stuff up, but okay, that's fine. Inst instrumental arrangement Thanks. is when you take the song and you either add melody through rolls or strumming or you add melody through uh, Carter style picking. Every single instrument, Brian, has a different way to add melodies and chords together. So that's under the category of ar instrumental arrangement. Um, and like I said, we will circle back to that. That was a good question because every single instrument is gonna interpret that section differently. And that's that's the, the funny part about that. So let's talk about the, um, the anatomy chart here real quick. Don't worry, it's family safe, you'll notice and gender neutral, so hopefully I won't get any flack for this. Um, so number one, the most, these are by the way organized in terms of importance. So number number one, I consider knowing the root the most important thing. What is the root? Let's talk about that. That is the most important note. <laughs> it's, it's the home, it's the, it's the root of the tree. Um, how do we find it? We use a really cool trick I'm gonna teach you called chord radar. So that has to do with the, the next chart, the D string notes. The reason I did this is because of the common instruments that we all mostly play of guitar, banjo, and mandolin, we all have a string in the note of D. So this applies to all those instruments. Happens to be the lowest note on the banjo, unless you're tuned differently. So you're, you're going to want to use this chart or memorize the fact that on the D string, your letters are open is D, and then D sharp or E flat, same thing, and then E and F. Don't worry so much why these letters are called this or why D sharp's the same as E flat. I'll tell you about that when you're older, okay? Right now, we just want to be able to use this chart for chord radar. So after the 12th fret, as most of you probably know, everything starts over, okay? So now the neat thing about this concept is, in my primitive understanding of radar, it's a sweep. And if an item is somewhere, during that sweep, the item will get noticed because it's sweeping an area. Um, so here's how we create a radar beam with our notes on the D string. All you're gonna do is pick the string over and over again. And as we're picking it, that's our radar mo motor, if you will. Here's the sweep happening. I'm gonna move up fret by fret. I'm moving really slowly up. While I'm doing that, I'm humming a note. And I'm keeping that even. I'm not changing that note with my voice, okay? So this is an exercise I want you guys to do on your own, is hum any note. I'm just gonna pick a note out of the air. Now while I do that, I'm gonna kick in my radar. Watch what happens. Mm. There it is right there. It's the ninth fret. I matched at the ninth fret. Then you're going to go look on your chart, and that's going to tell you that's a B. So you just determined that any note floating in the air, some random note you decided to hum, you just determined the name of it using the chord radar and knowing the notes on your D string. That's a trick you can use anywhere, anytime, to find the key of a song. I've done that at jams. If someone's playing in a really weird key, let's say they're playing in A flat, hopefully on purpose, okay, I will sit, I'll, I'll turn away from the jam, I will hum that note, mm, I'll do the radar, mm, there it is right there. Good musicians will do this. They won't necessarily be really obvious about it, they're kind of, they're kind of, um, Hunt and pecking more, not scanning, but nonetheless, it's the same process. So that's the chord radar chart on your D string notes. That's going to be your best friend as we move deeper into learning the keys of songs. The root's almost always the last note. I can't tell you how many of my students are like, well, I know how to find the key. It's the first chord or, or the first note. It's the last. It's where it ends. It's where it goes home to. 
Now, some songs don't do this, like the infamous Wagon Wheel, which is, in my theory, one of the reasons why it's getting so much shade these days, because it ends on the four chord and therefore has to go back to the beginning and therefore never ends. So there could be a problem there. But uh, most decent civilized songs end on the root or the key. So just listen to how it lands and that's your key. If you can't find it or if it ends on something that you're suspicious of, go back to your chord radar, all right? Let's go to page two in our outline. Already I can see you guys are gaining tools that you can use to find keys to songs without having any clue, okay? Um, song part two in Song Anatomy is the key. Now, we understand the roots, the main note of the song, okay? The key is the neighborhood of those notes and all the things that are next door to that and like to hang out with that, alrighty? So we're gonna circle back to this with chord families, but just know that a key is a musical neighborhood and you can't play in the neighborhood until you find out where your home is, otherwise you're gonna get arrested. You don't live there. Um, let's talk about the theory approach real quick. Now, breaking my rule of training you not to have to have paper, if you do happen to have the key signature of the song, forget all this voodoo, just look at it. And if you know key signatures to go, it's got three sharps, it's the key of A. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's a shortcut. I'm teaching you if, ways to do this if you don't have the theory approach and you don't know the key signature. Remind me at our private lessons to talk about key signatures if you want to go down that dark path more. Right, let's go to song part three, scales and modes. This is a little harder to understand. So you all can imagine that any melody, hang down your head, tum -tum -tum, hang down your head and cry, or each of those songs have a very different mood. Tom Dooley is kind of an upbeat, happy sound. Man of Constant Sorrow is a darker sound. You can guess why. One's based on a major scale, one's based on a minor scale. That's what make melodies is the scale they're based on. So without getting too dense into the theory of it, let's talk about the modes of a scale. So I consider a scale just a storage system for notes. If you have a G major scale, those are all great notes, but the way that they're lined up is kind of boring. That's why, although this isn't in the scope of this class, I teach all of you to try, try to improvise with your scales and not get stuck in just ascension and dissension. You want to make music. There's a difference between this and this. But that's a subject for a different class. And I have um, a group class on YouTube on the channel called um, Secrets to Improvisation. So if you want to go down that road, check that one out. Uh, let's talk about modes. So everything has up or down pitch we talked about, how to find a root, how to find a key. But then we have light or dark flavors. So scales are the same way. Now, the funny thing about modern scales is that they're really kind of dualistic. They're major or minor, they're dark or light. But there's a whole nother family of scales that some of you who've worked with me have talked about called the modes that are all the gray areas in between. Let's look at our chart um, called Scale Species, the first page of that. And we're gonna go over, by the way, there's way more scales than this. There's more scales than on a thousand pound Marlin. However, for our purposes, all we need to know about is these scales on this chart. These are the most common and most important ones. So these are formulas. All this means is the one is the root, and then we're moving up a number of scale steps. So a major scale is gonna be just seven steps up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I say eight is the same as one again, because it's an octave higher. That's why the parentheses. Now, the mixolydian, as many of you know, is the classic folk or bluegrass scale one of them, and it's the same major scale with a flatted seventh. Watch what happens, the flavor. Remember, we're talking about flavors of the ear here. So this, what, this, this tasted happy. This, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, one. Now we've got a bit of blues in there. It's still bright and happy because the major third, but that flat seven puts a little blues on the top of it. Then we have the pentatonic. It's a major scale where you take out the four and the seven, and that's a five note scale. Very fluffy, very happy. 
So watch this. One, two, three, no four, five, six, no seven. One. Very bright and folksy. Then we have what I call the folk scale. That's the pentatonic with added flat three and seven. Now we have that bluegrass country sound. One, two, flat three, major three, no four, because it's pentatonic based. Five, six, flat seven, one. Almost all the fun licks are based on that scale. What's really odd, my friends, is when we go over to the minor scales, we have more of them. The dark side has more scales. These are the darker flavors, and there's like there's more of them than there are the majors. We have the natural minor scale. One, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. Da, 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 da. Your classic soft, sad sound. Now, the harmonic minor sharps the seven, and now we get the classical sound. That's what all the Baroque and classical music's written on because they wanted that fancy sharp seven in there to sound elegant. Then we have the pentatonic minor. One, flat three, four, five, flat seven, one. And by the way, if these numbers aren't making sense to you, please take a note, ask me at your lesson, and I'll break it down for you. Now, the Dorian is a minor scale with a raised six, a softer sound, but still dark. And finally, we have the blues scale where we add a bunch of jazz notes and it sharpens it up. Why did I go over all those scales? Because when you're learning melodies by ear, they're going to be based on a scale and the odds are very high. It's going to be one of those scales. So that's the beauty of having that as a reference, whether in your brain and the old skull drive or as a sneaky chart in your banjo case. You can, if you hear a melody that goes, you got to go, wait a minute. I heard that flat five in there. That has to be a blue scale. Then you can find it on your instrument. Now you can learn the melody a lot faster because you know the framework that it's built on. Scales are where melodies come from. Yeah, Question, so, Brian. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know this, but it's just a point that's confusing to me is when I think about, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but it's got to fit into the fact that there are 12 notes potential uh, to figure, again, the whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. So I, mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to think about it not from the, one, two, three, I got to think about it from the the first one, one to two is a whole step, two to three is a whole step, to four is right. a half step, right? Yeah, the so, easy solution there, my friend, is everything's based on the major scale, and then we change it from there. Right, so I'm long, just saying, I have to, right, so when I, I got that one, but when I'm thinking about the next one, it's like, okay, what's, what's really happening there? So, FYI. That's a good point. I could have predicated that by saying, before you can understand or manipulate that formula, you do want to at least be able to play one major scale on your instrument, just one. As long as you can go one major scale, I don't care where it is or who you got it from, could be Banjo Ben, I don't care. And then basically you change every, from there you use that as your template. But yeah, you don't want to sit around going whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. First of all, it sounds kind of funny. Second of all, you can memorize that series on your fingerboard and then you don't have to think about those tones. Very good point though. Now, um, chord families. This is where the rubber hits the road, my friends. So let's say you have you hear the song on YouTube. You use your chord radar to find the key. You use your understanding of the flavors of major, minor, or seventh to determine whether it's a major song, a minor song, or a blues song, because a blues song is going to have a lot of seventh chords in it. That's a big flag. Okay. Now we want to figure out what chords are we likely to encounter in that key. Let's say the key is C, as in cat. Okay. In the key of C, We've got the options of C, F, G, D minor, A minor, E minor. Now, here's the disclaimer. There may be many other chords. Most songs don't limit themselves to the diatonic family here. However, it's a great starting point because the odds are pretty high. Any song in C is going to use those chords. The primary chords are the ones that are major, hence primary. The secondaries are usually minor. Now, what's interesting, my friends, is when you go to the minor keys, the dark kingdoms, now it reverses. Your primaries on top are minor, mostly, and your secondaries underneath are major. So it's a really interesting reflection. A minor key is like a major key flipped on its head, which relates to the relative minors. Now, let's say the song was in A, and you have figured out that the key is A. You use chord radar. Mm -hmm. That matches an A. The next one 
ask questions. What chords is this song going to use? That's when you employ this and you go, okay, I'm going to listen to the YouTube, go over and over again, or my friend plays guitar, and then I'm going to go, he, he or she just went to another chord, and you're going to play the primary chords, and the chances are it's going to match one of those. If you hear a darker sounding chord, you're going to play one of the secondaries, and it matches one of those. So it's just giving you a big boost towards probably knowing all the chords to the song. Now, um, in the interest of full disclosure, my chord families are basically a condensation of the circle of fifths, which have all the keys and all the chords in their possible relationships. I just wanted to put the, the six main ones you find together in little, little glumps, if you will. However, if you find this intriguing, remind me to go over the circle of fifths with you in our next lesson. It's, it's pretty fascinating, in, including the fact that it should be called the circle of fourths because music moves in fourths and not fifths. But that's my own bitter conspiracy theory that we can get into later. Um, now, using the chord chart to predict the chords. If you have your chord family or circle of fifths present and you know what key you're in, like I said, when you hear a new chord happen, I want you to try on different chords and one of them will fit like a glove. And you're listening for that unison match. When you're doing chord radar, if the key was here, something really weird, and I'm gonna find it through radar. Mm, I hum it first, then I move up fret by fret, and I can hear when it matches. Pretty much every biped I've ever encountered um, can tell when two notes are the same. Keep remembering this, my friends. I know all of you can tell when two notes are the same. And if you could do that, you could do everything else in this class because it's all predicated on that, on recognizing unison. It's really wild how simple that is. Now, let's talk about charting chord progressions. And this is something, those of you who are using my backing tracker app, this is going to be very handy for you. And you want to basically open up the app. It's going to have the blank chord chart. Go to YouTube. This is your exercise. I'm going to start assigning you all, and I'll know if you haven't done it because I'm going to ask about it when I see you again, is... Go to YouTube, pick a song you don't know. You gotta be honest here. You can pick an artist, you know, John Prine, whatever. Make it sort of easy on yourself. Okay, Bob Dylan. And then you're gonna listen to it. You're gonna do these steps. You're gonna find the key with chord radar. You're gonna have your chord families out to look at. And you're gonna start trying to figure out which chords happen in a row and putting them into the backing track. Okay. The reason we're putting it in there, because you can title that and save it, and it will say Bob's Chord Exercise 1 or something. Put your name on there. Okay. That way I can know who to blame. <laughs> Just kidding. That way I can pull it up at our lesson. We can look at it. Also, you can have a side assignment and jam along with it. So learning the chords to songs is something that is the most important skill. Imagine when you get really fast at this, and you will. Guess what? You can show up to a jam circle sit into the circle, your eyes turn into little spirals. Within three minutes, you sound like you knew the song using these same techniques I'm talking about just very rapidly. That's all I do. People say, how, how do you know all these songs? I don't. I'm just learning them by ear instantly at the moment. So I don't have, well, I can't memorize anything anyway. That's why I had to learn this. Now, um, I have a question. Yes, please. I love questions. Well, what was the three things or whatever things we're supposed to do on YouTube? What are we figuring out for the unknown song? Yeah. Remember, it always starts with, with the, the root and the key. So the first thing when you hear that is to try to find out what the main home note or home chord is. And you can cheat by going to hearing the ending, but just know that sometimes that won't be the case. So then once you hear that repetitive home note, you might have to find it through chord radar, maybe not. And then you're going to use the chord families to determine what the likely other chords are going to be as related to that home note or key. Okay? And if it sounds predominantly dark, you're going to go to the minor chord families. If it sounds predominantly cheery, you're going to go to the major chord families. Now, I understand this is not totally surgical, guys and gals. This is going to lead you astray at times. But it's better than no map. It's like a map, a treasure map. It's still better than no map, okay? Now, that's a very good question, Kim. So that, and, and once again, after this class, email me if you have questions. Say, what was I supposed to do again? That's the phrase I hear a lot. I, I will gladly answer your questions again as well. So let's talk so I, about, go ahead. I have a, again, sorry. Um, no worries. I understand the homework questions. assignment, but what, <laughs> what, what is interesting is to think that I could hear and determine from a song the fact that I'm able to 
figure out what the chord is 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 baffling. And can you give can you do an example in front of us? Absolutely. In fact, if you look at uh, item five, putting it all together, which we're rapidly approaching, that's precisely what I will be doing. And is it the first chord, second chord, tenth? I mean, how last do you one. The last chord of what? Of the melody? Of the whole song. The last thing that happens before the song goes away. Oh, okay. That's your key. Almost always. Almost eighty-nine percent. It. <laughs> It so works. for Grateful Dead, I gotta wait for twenty minutes to find the end of the song. You gotta wait a while, yeah. But nonetheless, it'll be worth it when you get there. <laughs> um, how many Grateful Dead heads does it take to change a light bulb? It takes all of them, but first they have to follow the old light bulb around for forty years till it burns out. I'm sorry, Brian, you you started that. <laughs> Anyhow, how many folk musicians to change a light bulb? One to change it, and the rest to write it, write a bunch of songs on how good the old light bulb was. <laughs> And Ethan's got a songwriting look on his face. Uh-oh, that's happening. Okay, so check this out. We're going to talk about, um, I'm about to get to that demo, and I know you're all looking forward to that because you probably want to see me fail. Just kidding. Uh, that's going to be something where I'm going to do this live in front of you, just like I did with that note-guessing trick, which I think you did okay on, okay? And Kim, they don't have to know that we plan this ahead of time. Let's, off the record. So let, let's go ahead and talk about it, um, uh, the melody. Beautiful. So, Real quick though, item four under G is knowing the shapes. Everything I'm talking about is real ephemeral and mental and floaty. However, we all know that when you're learning chords through a song, it's gonna darn well help if you could actually make the chord physically on your instrument. So have a chord chart handy too, in case your chord radar leads you to B flat and you're like, oh crap, I ain't got one of those. Then you're gonna find it. So just be aware that there's the physical side of knowing your chords as well. And then we have two under G, which is approximating the musical style. This is something I'm going to cover in our privates. I can't really dive into it too much right now. It's a really deep subject. But basically, if it's a rock song, you're not going to go... You're going to try to mimic the style of the song with your right... Or I shouldn't... I have some left handies. Your strumming or picking hand, okay? So that's something that is up to you to as in arranging the song, which we'll circle back to. Now, putting it all together starts with tuning. Here's the part we've all been waiting for. What I'd like to do is have, in fact, um, Ethan, are you there? Yes, unmute yourself. How are you doing today, bud? I, I'm well. How are you? Good. It's, I'm glad you made it to class. Yeah, yeah I'm not late. Um, um, yeah, okay, so what, what do you want? I was going to see if you could call out a song, just so everyone knows I didn't choose this ahead of time. Oh man! Um, <laughs> hey, now don't be too cruel, by the way. No, give no, me a chance I, here. I, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> Google Dublin Blues. Dublin yeah. Blues. I'm doing it right here on the YouTube. So you, you should but, be seeing. But the there's packing. a there's a certain version. The version I want you to look at is uh, Katie Pan in Newtown. So everyone is watching. Everyone is listening. I'm going to go through how this system works. I'm going to use everything we talked about now, okay? Pretending like I don't know how to read music or don't know much about learning by ear. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to obviously play the song. Now, now I have my finger on pause. So I'm going to listen for a little bit and I'm going to start humming random notes until I hear what I think the key is. Or I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to go see how this darn song ends. You know what? I'm going to cheat, because Ethan picked such a toughie. We're going to go to the end of the song and see what that ending note is, or chord is. Here we go. Bear with me. That was the ending note. Now, don't let anyone say anything. Watch this. Mm -hmm. Key of F. You'll consult your D string note chart. That's an F. We just determined the song's an F. Out of the blue. Okay? Now, I'm going to go back to the beginning. I happen to know, you're going to look at your chord family's charts, but I happen to have memorized that the primary chords in F are F, B flat, and C, and the secondaries are D minor, A minor, and sometimes E have to finish seventh. We'll tell you why later. Okay, let's listen to the song and see which of those are right. Check this out. That's all F. Mm, same note. You're hearing the flavor. Same note. Uh, 
went up to that note, it changed chord later again. Key of G. We went to the five chord. What, what's the five chord? It's the key, it's uh, C. We went to C. Now, check this out. I'm gonna listen one more bit. Ethan, damn you, just kidding. Uh, the B flat. I, just check me on this. Is C and B flat important chords in the key of F? I think so. Okay, I'm seeing some agreements. Okay, beautiful. So now, are there any minor sounding chords? Does anything happen that sounds dark or minor? Here's our key. Go to the five. Four. Mm, back to the C. Now, remember, my friends, this is an approximate process. This is sketching with a really mushy pencil. This is painting with a chewed up paintbrush. However, that will get you there a lot faster than guessing in the dark. Did that mostly make sense what I did to your song there, Ethan? Okay, now you probably have the chord families memorized. Eventually you do want to memorize these chord families because they don't have to consult paper. My whole promise here is to get you off paper. However, ironically, sometimes it takes paper to get off paper. Okay, so that's the process we're doing here. now. Um, that was my demo. Now, if Ethan had been not a nice guy, he could have chose a song that had a lot of what we call accidental chords or chords that are not in the chord family or a lot of minor chords. And I would have had to listen really carefully to see which the flavor was. Okay. Remember, hey, if it, go ahead. Hey, Ray, uh, just, just real quick. Is it better to like remember the chord groupings as, as actual chords or use the number, you know, like the one, four, five? Here, that's a good question, Ethan. So you, you'll notice some of you that I say letters sometimes, and I'll say one, four, five, or numbers. The reason we use numbers, and you'll see in the first chord family in your chart, it's got numbers. So the primaries are one, four, and five, and the secondaries are two, three, and six. The reason we do that is because if we're saying letters, it stands to reason that you're going to have to play in that key. If I'm saying the song goes C, F, and G, everyone's going to have to play in C. If the lead singer says, well, that's too low, I want to move it up to D, I could say, okay, everyone's now going to play D, G, and A. I'll have to transpose it in my head. However, if I had been saying numbers the whole time, I would have said, hey, it's in C, and we we're going one, four, five. Oh, she wants to move it up to D. Okay, one, four, five still. I wouldn't have had to say any new chords because the numbers are the functional chord movement. The letters are what key or pitch you're on. It's almost like I don't understand math, but it's sort of an algebraic idea that the numbers are the formula. So when you use numbers, you don't have to be committed to a key. You can change keys anytime easily and call the same numbers. Okay, that's a very good question. That's almost more to do with jam leading and stuff. And I'm bad with math. As I like to say, there are only three kinds of people in the world, those who can count and those who can't. Now we're going to move on to advanced exercises in six. Um, one of my students like to say, he's like, Two words. I'm not dumb. <laughs> He's a teenager, so he has an off-kilter sense of humor. Now, um, let's take a peek at uh, six. I'm going to leave you with some really fun exercises you can do, okay? Um, interval recognition. Let's talk about what an interval is. This is a fascinating study. If I have a G note and I move up one fret, that's an interval away. Okay, so if you count, and this harkens back to your point, um, uh, Brian, is that there's really, if you do all the frets, there's a lot more notes than the notes in those scales, and that's called the chromatic scale. Chromatic coming from the Greek word chroma, or all colors. So a chromatic scale... ...has all 12 notes. It has all the colors. Now watch what happens when we compare each of the, those notes with a root. So if we have a root in G, and we combine it with a flat, the next available fret up, it's a flat two. Ooh, that's very dissonant, right? Most humans are gonna not like that sound. If we move up to the major two, the next available note, it's the interval of a major second. It's sort of dissonant, but in a nice soft way. One more, it's the minor third. Ooh, that's classical minor sound. It's soft and sad. The next one is a major third. The classical.
classic happy note in Western music. The next one is the fourth. That's kind of strong and medieval sounding. Then we have the next one is the flat fifth. Guess what? Terrifying. The, probably the arguably the most dissonant note in music. In fact, the flat fifth was not allowed in the composing of the 16th and 17th centuries. It was called El Diabolus and Musica, the devil's note. And you could get fined for using that in your compositions. It's been known throughout the centuries to create unrest and anxiety in people who hear it. This sound right here, check this out. Your classic alarm or, or a stare, like, that is the flat five. Anyway, that's a brief discussion on that flat fifth. Then we move up to the fifth. Solid. Guess what? All hard rockers use chords made out of just the one and the five. That's why they're called five chords or power chords. If you hear this, that's five chords. That's power chords. Then we have the next possible note, the flat six. Ooh, that's soft and sweet. Then we have the major six. Super dorky and happy. That uh, ridiculously, annoyingly happy song by uh, Paul Simon, um, Feeling Groovy, all sixes. Then we have the flat seven, the number one blues note. <laughs> then we have the major seven. Sounds really bad until you put it in a chord. Now it's Steely Dan. And finally we have the octave. I just described the flavors of all 12 tones in this scale. Now that's somewhat subjective. Some of you may hear this and go, that's so beautiful. That's a red flag. <laughs> Get on medication. No, who knows? Maybe you're really into advanced jazz, but generally, most of us have a similar sensibility to what we just went through with those 12 tones. That's an exercise you can do is basically play a G string and then match it with as many other notes as you can and stop and ask yourself what the flavor of each combination is. You're developing your ear's ability to experience the flavor of music, not the pitch. That's a different thing. I'm talking about the, the emotion of it, the flavor. Now, the next uh, advanced exercise is ear following chord progressions. We already talked about this, but I'm gonna detail this. You're gonna recognize the primary chords, what we just talked about, after you know the key, of course. Um, you're gonna recognize the secondary chords, and then you're gonna hear the flavors, and you're basically going to try to follow along at a slow song without writing it down. So if the song, like the one Ethan chose, happened to be F, <laughs> Down to F. Now, if I had known it was F, which you know how to do now, and if I had known the primary chords in F are F, B flat, and C, then as I try to follow along, I'm going to, like I said, you're still going to mess up, but you're going to have an 80% chance of doing it better than without this idea, okay? Like I like to say, it works 90% of the time, 50% of the time. It's a lot of it's like luck as well. Now, let's talk about transcribing. Okay, and by the way, if you all hear a song that you can't figure out and it's killing you, I have another company called Jam Along Transcriptions, or you can just call me. Anyway, I do transcribe songs for people, so send me the YouTube link and I can write it out for you. However, this is something I want you doing, and here's how it applies to you. If you hear a song, I want you to try to pick out the melody on your instrument. Now, this is a little more advanced. And, and circle back to me in our private lessons if you want more about this. But if you hear a song that goes, once again, I'll use that example. I am a man. The first thing I'm going to find is that I know. I, guess what? Chord radar. I, right there, boom. Now I know where to start. Now I'm going to start picking it out. When I hear the song go, I am a man, I'm going to go, not that, uh, by the way, this process is really bloody and really messy, and you're going to make a lot of terrible notes in the process. This is not surgical, okay? You're going to go, oh, there it is. There's a lot of, that's not it, that's not it, there it is, that's not it, there it is. You're going to be having a lot of that happen. But that's how you start to transcribe melodies. You hear it and then try to play it. If there's one exercise you want to do over all of this stuff I talked about today, hear it and play it. Put that on your beer fridge, on a post-it. Hear it and play it hear it and play it. The more you do that, the better you'll become 
at ear learning melodies on the spot. I, this works, trust me. I, I came from zero and got to ear learning without music until I learned it later in life. Now, um, let's talk about conscious listening. Now, when you go hear a band or a song, you're gonna hear it differently. You're gonna go, oh, that's a minor song. It's got a darker flavor. Oh, they moved down a whole tone. That must be an F chord from the G. You're literally gonna be just like me, the person that stands in the back of this show with their arms crossed, analyzing it. I've just ruined music for you. No, you can always just, you know, have an extra beer and listen too. But this will change the way you hear music because I want you, when you're driving to work and you're playing the stereo, I want you to try to apply some chord radar, some guessing of the chords with the chord families, some trying to determine, even say it out loud, if the chord is major, minor, or seventh. Your passengers are going to love you. This is something that you're going to start doing consciously as you listen now. It's changing the way you're going to hear music. Finally, we're talking about continuing your ear journey. Chart making with the YouTube and backing tracker. We talked about that. Go to YouTube, pick a slow song. Make sure it's slow. Use everything we talked about in this class, which, by the way, I'll put on YouTube later on the Jam Along channel. Please subscribe if you haven't. And you can watch this later and remember these steps for ear learning. Then we have ear training exercises with your Jam Along instructor. That would be me for the moment until I get more minions. But ask me at your lesson to exercise you with your ear learning. Heck, we could even do the same game I played with Kim a minute ago, where I'm going to play as a note and then another note, and you're going to try to guess how many frets I moved up. Those kind of games strengthen your ear. And I could do this with you at our sessions. So if you want more of that, please bring that up to me. Then we have tabbing out songs. That's another hillbilly way. Well, I'm not supposed to say hillbilly. Appalachian American way to say transcribing. And basically, you're going to use those lines and numbers and zeros to try to write down what you figured out. Just so you remember it and you can brag about it later. I know it's ironic. You're writing down what you learned by ear. Hey, some of this stuff doesn't make sense, but we have to have some way to remember it or record it on your cell phone. Finally, I leave you with the concept of jamming, jamming, jamming. Raise your hand if you're actively jamming and don't feel bad if you're not, just feel guilty. Okay, wonderful. I'm telling you, whoever is jamming knows that ear is king. You rarely are gonna sit down and they're gonna hand you a chord chart and go, here's the key and here's what we're playing. A lot of these people, that I see right here on the screen that jam a lot are using these same skills we talked about. Now, we just want to employ those same skills to learning songs we've never heard before, okay? So there's many chances to do this. By the way, next time you're on Jam Along site, hit events, look at my jam camps. I'm having one in June. I'm having one in October. If you're near enough to fly out to California, come and jam for four days straight. It's another way to get flight time in is jam camps or, or having your own jam camp in your backyard. As long as you have an opportunity to play by ear and not have a chart in front of you on a music stand. That's the tools that I used to teach myself how to learn songs by ear. Um, I'm gonna open it up to a brief question and answer period. Okay, good, we're done with that. No, just kidding. Does anyone have a question about, a general question, not you, Brian. <laughs> That's fine. You're, I loved your questions, very smart. Um, yeah, I have a question. This is Tom. Hey, good to see you, man. Hey, hey, uh, Glad so, you made it. yeah, so in finding melodies um, of a song, yes, uh, isn't that usually one of the chord tones that you find the melody? Is that isn't that usually one, three, and five of that part of the song? Well, that's, the that's a really good point you make. Some people do use the chord approach and they'll try to find one of the notes inside of the chord that's playing okay yeah you can do that the problem with that is every chord basically can have three tones in it a triad right one three and five right. so it's right. a little more of a scattergun approach because if i'm playing a melody based out of g you're gonna you're gonna go okay g is made of a, made out of g b and d so it's gonna be one of those okay however i think it's faster honestly to try to zero in on the single note forget the chord and find it with chord radar, a note radar using humming it. So if the note had been B, Tom, rather than go, oh, it's a G chord, so it's gonna be G, B, or D, I'd rather you go, la, 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 la. there it is, boom. 
and kind of zero in on it like a, a laser guided approach as, as opposed to more of a, a three note scatter gun approach. Does that mostly make sense? Yeah. They yeah. both work. Don't get me wrong. Chords work, but I think it's a little faster to zero in on single notes, personally. Okay. Especially if you're jamming, you don't have that kind of time. Okay. Very good question. A lot of people work from chords as opposed to melodies. That's a really good point. Any other questions, good people? Otherwise, I'm going to let you all get back to your beautiful weekend. Yeah, of course I do. So that of first do, example, of course, that example that Kimberly hit a hit a, uh, yeah, I guess on the D string, and she hit a. Yeah, that was scary. Press. I didn't want to fail on that because I'm recording this. <laughs> but how did I mean? But you didn't walk up the fret. You were able to have you. You were able to do that in your head. I did walk up the frets in my head exactly. Okay, so, so, so I heard this in my mind. I picked. I knew that milk, right? I knew she was going to use the G string, right? Okay. So in my mind, I'm hearing. I'm hearing that already. I know the scale. So when she went like that, I'm like, oh, that's mm, do re mi fa so. That's one two three. Four. That's zero two three four seven. I'm literally running scales in my mind, so it's not as glamorous as it looked. I'm just well, just the it fact you even said do re mi fa so. I mean, that was that in itself was a, a good way to approach it to change the the key. I guess is that the right term. The, the note from the, the, the note, the yeah, note. Yeah. it's relative pitch. So all yeah. that is, remember, it's being able to hear a note and another note and know the difference between them, the distance between them. That's what relative so, pitch is. So can you can we try that one more time? Where can, no. can we the note? <laughs> and and so again, you walk it up with a do re mi, so I can hear that because I I would just I would have to do it on my instrument to try and get up. Well, I'll tell you what, I did it on my instrument many, many, many times. And all sure of a sudden, I realized I could hear it in my head. Right. Trust me, this will eventually get into here, you know, and eventually get into your heart. And then you're just playing with joy and everyone's happy. Uh, but no, that's a very good point. Remember, have a little faith on this one. You have to actually just trust me and believe that if you play enough of these scales, that's why I gave you those scale formulas to spark your interest in that. If you play enough of these on your instrument, you're going to be able to hum them. And remember, combine the two, play and hum. Remember, play and hum? So if you do it together, the more you do stuff like that, the more it'll connect the mind with the fingers. It's connecting those two things. Man, I love these kind of classes because I'm on the edge of my seat. Some of this stuff I do, I don't really know how to teach, but I'm just showing you how I learned to learn by ear. This is how I did it. Add to it, change it, please share it. It's not my knowledge. I just channeled it. Give it out and call me if you have any questions. Thank you so much for coming to this group. It's been a wonderful time. I had a great time. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you all at your lessons. Thank you. And call, I'll just be gardening and picking banjo all weekend. So call me if you need. Thanks, guys. See you at our lessons. Peace out.